Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 28th meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Can I ask everyone to turn mobile devices off and, and put them away? This morning, we have apologies from Alec Cole Hamilton, and I welcome Beatrice Wishart, who's substitute Wishart, sorry, who is um, substituting for Alec this morning. Um, our first agenda item is a decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take agenda item three in private? Thank you. Agenda item two is race equality in Scotland. Um, can I welcome Danny Boyle, Parliamentary Officer for Bemis, Jatin Haria, Executive Director, Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights, John Wilkes, Head of Scotland, Equality and Human Rights Commission, Kaliani Lyle, former Race Equality Framework, pardon me, Framework Advisor for the Scottish Government, good morning, and Parveen Khan, Race Equality Mainstream Officer. CEMVO. Um, you're all very welcome this morning. Can I um, start off by asking for your reflections um, on, I suppose, what was prompted by um, the letter from Clare that in the Scottish Parliament we've simply not made enough progress um, on race equality in the last 20 years. Um, a big question, I suppose, but if I could have a, a couple of minutes reflection on that from, from each member. Kalyani, would you wish to start? <laughs> uh, I think uh, the evidence is quite clear that the answer to that question is yes. Um, you haven't made progress. Uh, I mean, the <clears throat> if you look at um, evidence on employment statistics, for instance, the outcomes, um, BME people are twice as likely to be, regardless of the fact that they have high educational attainment. Um, you look at overcrowding in housing, four times as likely to be living in, if you look at poverty, if you look at all the evidence recently on bullying in schools, or if you look at what's happened at um, in, in universities, if you look at um, the employment of, of, of doctors, um, <clears throat> the, um, uh, the ethnic pay um, deficit that they get. I mean, the evidence is overwhelming. The answer is um, that very little ha in the last 20 years uh, has been done that would make you feel that progress has been made. I think the tragedy is that it's not for the want of um, investigating and, and looking at what the problems are. Um, or, m many of you around the table would have been involved in committees or inquiries, and, and you've had that over and over and over again. The issue for me is having done lots of work in where the problems are, are and having agreed that there is there are problems, why isn't it that we haven't made the progress we sh that we should have made? What have been the blockages? Um, and I think that should be the starting point. What should, rather than reinventing the wheel over and over again and coming up with millions of actions that actually don't take you anywhere, it's the starting point is, you know, what are the blockages? Why, haven't, why hasn't there been greater progress than, than there should have been? Yeah, that's helpful. Um, can I bring in other panel members on that? Um, Jatin. Yeah, um, so that letter about the 20 years of uh, discussion or lack of discussion in Scottish Parliament it was a slightly separate thing. I mean, we did that to chime in with the 20th anniversary of the Scottish Parliament. And I mean, we felt that was the case, but we actually did the research behind the debates and everything. And, and I think the issue there is, uh, I totally agree with everything Kalyani has said about the issues, but it's about the lack of scrutiny on race equality. Is that allowing the problems that Kalyani has mentioned to go unheeded? Uh, so that, that, that was what that letter was about. Uh, We'd separately written to, to this committee asking for a scrutiny of the Race Equality Action Plan. That actually came before, because I think we wrote that in, in the summer. Uh, and that was because when we'd seen the year one action plan update, we were quite disappointed with what, what we read in that. Uh, and again, it's back to if there isn't scrutiny on these things, who, who will actually improve them? Um, so that, that's, that's where the two letters, I suppose, are, are coming from. I mean, we're, we're in a slightly tricky situation just now uh, in a positive way in that we're actually talking to the Equality Unit about improvements to reporting on the action plan updates, et cetera. So uh, that, that doesn't negate our concerns about the year one update, but 
but and, and also I think as Kalyani has outlined, we've been here so many times with the same old issues. So even though there is a refresh going on, there's no guarantee what will come out of it will be as useful as we want it to be. So we'd welcome ongoing scrutiny, uh, including by this committee, on those issues. Thank you. Do any other members wish to? Uh, come in? Sorry, panel members, I should say. Uh, Danny Blair. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> good morning, uh, committee. Um, thank you for, for inviting us all here today, and thank you for for our uh, breakfast this morning. It's always easier to give evidence after <laughs> on, on a full belly. Um, in terms of 20 years and, and the letter from Claire, which instigated the, the discussion which we have here today with regards to the progress or not that's been made with race equality in Scotland and what's reflected in the race equality framework and, and the race equality action plan, uh, I don't know if I have the benefit of, you know, I was still at school 20 years ago, so I come with to, to a certain degree with a, with a fresh pair of eyes on it. And I completely take colleagues' points that there is a general frustration both within organisations and, and experts here and within the communities who are represented that we've not seen uh, the substantive change take forward and the transformative uh, substantive change that, that there's quite clearly a significant uh, appetite for uh, across communities. But we are here nonetheless, and we do have an Equalities and Human Rights uh, Committee. We do have, for, for all of its uh, you know, potential uh, challenges which we have taken it forward, we do have a race equality framework for Scotland and we do have a year one action plan. We do have a commitment from government to progress this uh, and for that to be scrutinised. And so we entirely welcome the Equality and Human Rights initial session. I think we all are absolutely clear that this morning is just a sort of a slight chap at the door uh, as opposed to a comprehensive review of what's going on. And with that, with that in mind, I think it's, it's valuable for the committee to be aware of from the get-go when we're discussing race equality in Scotland and racial discrimination, particularly through the prism of equalities and human rights, uh, about where we derive the authority to actually understand where these problems are occurring and who, who they affect and who the race equality framework and the race equality action plan in Scotland has been developed to respond to. So I would just place on record with the committee that the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination uh, places the, that racial discrimination shall mean any distinction, exclusion, restriction, or preference based on race, colour, descent, or national origin. And that's largely been uh, transcribed word for word into different areas of UK equalities law, uh, Scottish criminal law, uh, and the Human Rights Act, obviously, which here as well. So what we heard this morning from some of the communities uh, uh, convener that, that, that from we heard in terms of the diversity of issues which affect them, we heard, you know, Trishna from Sikh Sangog talking about employability issues which affect that community, Kalida Intercultural Youth Scotland talking about a whole plethora of issues with regards to education and bullying. Uh, nudge me when I was discussing with her. So, sorry, it's just that it's, that, um, it, it's a critical point I'm making, which I'll come right back round to we've, just after. We've got, I, think, I would just wish to say that this morning was an informal session. So yes, I yes, think sorry. if we can bring you back to the the, the, the question that I asked around the, why the reason, progress... The, re the, the reason why I was given the specific examples from the communities is they directly link to the International Convention because these communities engage with race equality in Scotland based upon a number of these characteristics. Okay, so when the committee is taking this forward, it should be aware of the different dynamics which are in play when it comes to race and racial discrimination sure. and race equality in Scotland. Okay. When it comes to the progress and the role of the committee and the parliamentary Danny, structures... I'm, I'm going to pause you there because I want to get round everyone and give everyone an opportunity to just open up. We will have lots of questions from um, my colleagues and, and we'll get into okay. the, the detail of it. Parveen, do you have anything you wish to say <coughs> on that general yeah. point about lack of progress and, and Thank why Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that in terms of what um, supporting other colleagues and particularly Kalyani and what she said about that. I think for us in Senville Scotland it's more about how we measure. Um, some of the outcomes are harder to measure um, and, and some of the, 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 the race equality framework as it stands in the action plan often there needs to be some kind of improvement in terms of aligning alignment within that so we're reporting it's harder to um, report on some of those actions. Um, so because the framework doesn't actually pick up within the action plan um, some of the, the, the measures that we have. And so reporting on that, we need to include uh, progress on some of the actions. So some of the, the capacity of the public sector to tackle racial equality can be lost 
um, whilst that's happening. Um, so, I, I mean, we welcome the fact that there is a framework, there's an action plan, needs some better alignment between the two. Um, also taking on board that some actions are easier to measure and to, to basically report on than others. John, do you have anything you wish to add? Yes, thank you. And thank you for inviting the Commission along today. I think I wouldn't have much to add in terms of the comments that others have said. As the equality body for Scotland and the rest of Britain and the, the, the organisation that uh, looks after the Equality Act and all of those sort of things, um, we would just say, of course, like others have said, there is lots of evidence to suggest that progress in areas of inequality is slow including in race inequality um, and that is systemic and therefore systemic issues are often quite hard to move forward quickly. Um, I think the issue of having an overall framework with a target of 2030 is a good approach to take. Obviously the activities to get there are milestones along the way. Um, so that's good. So our evidence, you know, we have to produce a report every three years about the progress of equalities is Scotland Fair and it demonstrates quite clearly that progress is slow and in some areas is going backwards. Um, so we welcome the general approach. And so our perspective is really, you know, we have a strong framework of legislation around this in, in Britain with the Equality Act and also legislation that the Scottish Parliament has enacted to support that. And legislation is important, but obviously if that was the solution, then we wouldn't be here today. So legislation only provides the framework. It's changes in practice and behaviours by organisations, service providers, employers, and there's also the issues of attitudes in, in communities about these things as well. And th those things can fluctuate. So what we're very interested in is what are the tools that can help progress these things. And there are some very powerful tools. We don't think they're being used to full effect. And in terms of the role of the committee, uh, clearly government has a role to play and they've set out their aspiration in terms of the plan and I think the role of parliament in terms of a scrutiny body is, is important in that. I think this committee has a particular importance in this issue in terms of an overview, but I think it's also important for all the other committees because equality, inequality goes across all areas of the parliament's activity. So I think it's important not that this doesn't become pocketed here, that, that the committee can encourage other committees in the course of their work, whether that's employment or whatever it is, that they also look at these issues as well. Thank you. Beatrice. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, actually, John's probably just touched on a, a bit of what I was going to ask about how Parliament and all its committees could make changes to ensure that um, race is actually back on the parliamentary agenda. So I'd be interested to hear what the panel have thoughts they have on that. Who wishes to come in? Kelly, are you? Are you? Um, um, I think the issue of leadership is really important and I think the issue of therefore the role that Parliament can play and, and the various committees and, and, and ministers. I think where we see that it's worked really well is in the Gypsy Traveller section of the report. And I think there where you've had ministers around the table in a ministerial working group, where you've had <coughs> the um, engagement of, 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 um, at that level, I think you've seen the results in an area that has been so intractable for such a long time. I think it's been said as the last bastion of what people think is racism that you can get away with really and so the question for me then is what is it that we can learn from the way that that was done in terms of looking at the other areas that that where uh, progress has been less um, uh, has happened and, and and I think leadership there parliament people um, if if ministers and committees sign up to um, a set of of objectives or an ambition then actually making sure that that you put your money where your mouth is you're actually there to and and so um and holding people to account if you say you're going to do something why hasn't it happened uh and and so on so i think there is a huge role without it we're going to just be treading water and coming back always to the same point yeah um, danny wish to Thank you very much and thank you for the question because I think it's absolutely key to actually a positive uh, action point and progression we can take away from this particular committee meeting this morning within the time which we have. Even the, the, you know, the, the overview analysis of the year one report points out uh, that there's 84 action points across 32 different policy 
uh, areas. That's a significant breadth of work. And the discussion topics we have outlined here, community cohesion and safety, participation and representation, education, lifelong learning, so on and so forth. These are all critical components of it. And it would uh, be incredibly important, uh, not only that the equalities and human rights obligations of different government directorates and different cabinet secretaries and ministers take that forward, but that the relevant uh, parliamentary committees also provide that critical oversight. Because when we launched the, the Race Equality Action Plan conference last year with, with the Minister, Ms McKelvey, um, Bemis had, had pointed out that what we have to be very, very careful of and what has, ha, has been a vulnerability of the, the race sector for a significant period of time is that providing the silver bullet solution to race equality challenges in Scotland will be delivered by the third sector, will be delivered by Bemis or Clare or Semvo or whoever else. We can give examples of good practice, we can give research, we can give examples of how things could be progressed positively, but we are not the duty bearers when it comes to this. When it comes to employability, we need to speak to Skills Development Scotland. Are you responding to this action plan? If you're not, why are you not? We need to speak to various local authorities. The issue which has come up recently in a report which was launched at this parliament with regards to racial bullying within Edinburgh City Council, with regards to this uh, actual uh, with the race quality framework and the race quality action plan under the topic of community cohesion and safety, we need to ask local authorities, what are you doing about race bullying within your schools? What's your action plan? How are you taking this forward? The duty bearers must be brought to the table, and we're not saying bringing the duty bearers to the table in terms of bashing them about the head. It's about holding them accountable, and if they're not doing it properly, then they have to work positively with uh, or any of the organisations here, or necessarily have their fingers burned by the Equality and Human Rights Commission, because that is their role within this process. If these uh, legal obligations are not being adhered to, then we need to see some action against them, and the parliamentary committee structure has an absolutely critical role to play in ensuring that people's human rights are respected and actually taken forward. Does anyone else wish to comment? Um, Jason. Yeah. To try and answer your question specifically, uh, if, it, if race was discussed more widely in Parliament and in committees, I think mainly it would show leadership, as people have said, and ownership and accountability. Uh, it really sends a message if key race equality documents are not discussed by the Parliament when other key documents are. So if the framework was never discussed or the previous Equal Ops Committee's uh, inquiry onto race and employment was never discussed by a chamber discussion, that just sends a message it's not really that important, even though the work has been done by other people. Um, John's point of other committees discussing race more often is valid, but I don't see it happening. So we shouldn't, you know, I'm not sure we should go down things that are not going to happen. Committees are really busy already with their own business. So unless we can make sure it happens, let's, let's not recommend it unless there's a guarantee that that would have some impact. Um, there are other mechanisms uh, that we've suggested in the past uh, about, I mean, I think, if I'm right, there used to be a race rapporteur in, in, in sessions long ago for each committee. You know, we could look at bringing that back in, or why was that scrapped, uh, if, if it was scrapped, if I'm right on that one. Um, we'd suggested um, external co-optees onto committees as part of the uh, parliamentary reform uh, that the um, presiding officer was involved in a couple of years ago just to bring in a bit more expertise on race equality. Because one of the options, one of the issues might be some members may feel less confident speaking about these issues and therefore less confident of questioning witnesses on really tricky things. So maybe there's a training role as well for all MSPs within that. Um, people have spoken about learning from what works absolutely, uh, but we should also learn about what doesn't work so we don't make the same mistakes and we're not very good at doing that. And that doesn't apply just to scrutiny but on race equality initiatives. We've been there for so many years, over the last 30 years, and there's been probably thousands of initiatives. Many, well, most of them have not worked, but we've not learned why they've not worked. Hey, John. I was just going to say, in terms of the work of other committees, I mean, obviously part of the work of committees is you know, legislation. And when legislation comes along, there's a package of other things that come with it, the, the, what it's to, trying to achieve. And there's also the equality impact assessment. And that, for me, is one of the tools that committees have to say, whatever the legislation is, what is the assessment in terms of impact on different groups who might be affected disproportionately? And that's where the conversations about race and other groups can, can happen. If that can become more 
mainstreamed into the discussion, then you're starting to get that thinking, and then the, the gaps in legislation that might not have existed before might 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 get better legislation out of it. So I think see that as the as the role of committees in terms of their, certainly their legislative work. This committee has a different role, I think, in terms of more of an overview. But just to clarify the point I was making earlier, can I come back on, on the issue about uh, of say equality? impact assessments and I think one of the problems is they're not done really well mm. and so one of the things that I found really um, uh, inspiring in the Gypsy Travellers is the way that committees went out to speak to people affected by uh, a particular uh, in traveller traveller sites or looking at exact so th so what you had is and, and I'm sure people here who have who you had breakfast with this morning would have said the same is is where people are experiencing something and you sitting and talking to them as a committee and you look at what is the difference between what is being said by officials or what your actions are and actually what people are experiencing and look at that gap and what needs to happen to, because sometimes there is a kind of like a gloss or, or there is an appearance that things are happening but when you look on the ground to say what difference has that made to you Mrs so-and-so who is a, a, a Bangladeshi woman who is uh, unemployed, has children, disabled, or whatever, what difference has that made to your life? Then I think you have the ammunition to then look at well, so what is happening and what, what, what is the difference. Thank you. Do you wish to add anything, um, Praveen? I agree with what my colleagues have said. I think that there is a um, definite need for more accountability to be built in. Um, to the processes that we currently have. Um, for me as well, some of it's lacking in transparency. There is good work going on. Um, it's often not able to sort of pick out in terms of its transparency as to how well. Um, so if it is a quality impact assessing that's getting done, uh, where's, how's the data being collected? Where's, you know, how, how is that being then used to address some of the, the deficiencies, if you like, in, in policies and practices. So I think some of that is missing and, and not able to... The scrutiny can't happen then if they're not being published or they're not being promoted in any way or, or, or transparent, if you like. So I, I, would, I would agree with that. I think there is definitely a role for, for data and more um, robust data to be available, um, disaggregated as well. Um, we often don't have a clear picture as to what is the case and for, as Kellyanne was saying, for individuals in order to make an, a, an improvement or to, to, for them to have better experiences of service provision, we don't really know um, what the picture is. And, and that's because there's not enough data. We don't have enough data on mental health. We don't have enough data on and a lot of the issues that affect minority ethnic communities and a lot of the inequalities that are existing because of that. So um, that would be... Thank you. Mary Fee. Thank you, um, convener, and, and good morning, panel. Um, I wanted to, first of all, ask you about um, the definition and the language that's, that's used to describe um, race and ethnicity, because you'll know that there's different language used. There are a number of different definitions used to describe race and, race and eth ethnicity, and there are very strong views on, on what those definitions should be. So can I ask the panel, firstly, do you think the definitions that we currently use are helpful? And if you think they are, why are they helpful? Or do you think we should have a different single definition that, that covers every everything? Danny. Uh, so this is the Equality and Human Rights uh, committee of the Parliament, and I, I read out earlier what was the ICERD International Convention on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, Article 1, definition which has the five characteristics, race, colour, descent, national or ethnic origin, which has been integrated into relevant statutes of, of law in Scotland and the UK. That Article 1 definition, when it comes to discussing what any potential future definition may look like, this is a, this is a, a definition of customary international law, i.e. it cannot be derogated from, it cannot be removed. This is uh, the definition as it sits. The question, therefore, is does this definition and its integration into the domestic legal regime give us an appropriate platform to analyse and speak about the variations in circumstances, racial discrimination and racial inequalities which face all of the communities who self-define 
under this uh, particular definition. And the reason why I was elaborating on it within my initial, initial submission, I was talking about diverse intercultural youth from many, many different uh, backgrounds. I was talking about the issue of Sikh women's employability and Muslim women's employability. And I was talking also then, I was going to go on and elaborate that people who define under this definition also come from Scottish Gypsy Traveller community, from a Polish community, from a Jewish community, from a multi-generational Irish community, from multiple African communities, from black communities, from black and Caribbean communities. So this definition is broad enough to give all of those organisations and all of those individual citizens of Scotland the place to access their recognition. Their recognition within this context is not up for debate. It's non-negotiable. It's a customary piece of international law. The Equalities and Human Rights Committee of the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government, Scottish Government Ministers, our 32 local authorities, our multiple statutory bodies do not have the right to narrow that or say it means something completely different. One of the biggest challenges we face from our perspective in progressing race equality in Scotland is that you're entirely right, and I'm sure colleagues would agree if they come even from a different perspective, is that if we talk about 32 local authorities, there's potentially 32 different definitions of race being utilised. Most of them, uh, and a significant number of them, won't be responding to this customary international norm, which is set out in the ICERD Convention, to which the UK is signatory and ratified, and it's integrated into our legal system. From Bemis's perspective, we use the comprehensive definition because it allows us to talk about issues which face people of colour. It allows us to talk about issues which face people of nationality and descent and national and ethnic origin. And our intention in doing so is to raise awareness within the communities themselves of the variations of experiences which they face, which are actually very, very similar across different areas. Where there's differentiations, uh, say people of colour are, are discriminated against in a specific way in a specific policy area, we must respond to that specifically. But what we can say from, for example, poverty and the dis disproportionate number of people who live in poverty in Scotland, they come from multiple African communities, they come from our Polish community, and they come from our Scottish Gypsy Traveller community. This is why we endorse and will always follow the use of the comprehensive definition. And actually, when it comes to the committee and the committee structure and the Scottish Government's race equality framework and Scottish Government directorates and local authorities and statutory bodies, we need leadership on what race means because we have a complete uh, you know, scattergun approach to what race is. And it means that it is continually not being dealt with appropriately and not being dealt with in terms of what the statutory legal obligations of these duty bearers are. <laughs> Would any other panel members like to like to comment? Our perspective as the Commission is obviously what's in the Equality Act, yeah. which, which is quite broad in its, its determination of what race yes, is. And it reflects yeah. what Danny said in terms of its, its colour and nationality, and citizenship, <laughs> ethnic and national origins. And, that. and in the first 10 years of the operation of the Equality Act, I don't think we feel that that's posed particular issues in terms of things that have been presented to us as acts of discrimination. And I think there's a body of case law now. So in terms of how it's defined in the Equality Act, uh, that's pr pretty broad. Obviously, there are other uh, discussions taking place around around this, but that would be our perspective, I, I think, from the, from the legislative perspective. Okay. Can I, I, uh -huh. I think the I think the important thing is to be led by the evidence. I think uh, we, I mean, part of what Danny was saying, um, you rather than start off with. Uh, a kind of what aboutery, you know, this is so, so what about so, is to look, here is the evidence, and this is what we know, and therefore, these are the key things we need to do to make a difference to that, and within that wide, broad spectrum. Um, I'm, I'm one who wants to see change, and I, and, and I don't want to be bogged down by, um, Endless. I think language is important. I think definitions are important. But I think we should be led by the evidence. Yeah. yeah um, again, to answer your question, I mean the legal definition is there, and and no one's really disputing that. So that's not an issue for up for discussion really. Um, but it, it it isn't. I mean, in a sense, so it protects everybody. Everybody has an ethnicity, so everybody is protected by the Equality Act on. on anti-discrimination on gen uh, on race grounds, but same same as gender grounds and uh, other grounds. Every, ev every single person is protected. So it's not useful to just say that's a legal definition and, and that's enough. The legal definition, uh, by and large, stops us from discriminating against other people. 
And as John said earlier, if, if the legislation was all there was to it, we wouldn't be having this discussion right now. There's a lot more to it than that. There's a real lack of understanding of what racism is, and, and I think that's the fundamental part of why we're not getting uh, very far. So um, if we don't talk about power relationships when we talk about racism, then we're not actually talking about racism. If we don't talk about whiteness when we talk about racism, we're not talking about racism. If we don't talk about structural racism, we're not talking about racism. So unless we have a real understanding of all these things, and, and if we just go back to the legal definition, we actually get nowhere. Pa just before I bring you, you, you back in, Danny, pa Pardeen, I don't know, do you have any, um, any thoughts on this? I would support what Jatin just said in terms of um, the fact that, again, you know, we, the, the legal definition it does cover um, all the different categories, if you like. But in reality as well, it's how people define themselves um, as well within that. So legally you're protected, um, but at the same time, if you don't have those conversations and look at these the categories within that, if you don't look at the different aspects of race, then you can't really um, actually uh, serve, if you like, the people. So it goes back to, I think, that what the role of... The, the Human Rights Committee, Equality and Human Rights Committee as well, in terms of having a legal definition, but it has to be much more than that in terms of conversations, um, instead of, in terms of what it actually means to people. So do you think there's a, there is a job of work, both for us as a committee and as a parliament, to um, talk more about the legal definition, but what sits within that, that legal def definition, so we can talk about all the different um, race and ethnicity groupings within that legal definition? Would that be helpful? Yeah, but also if to we meet the constant link between the two. Yeah, but also bearing in mind that the experiences will be different. Yeah, absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. the, the experiences. Are, so it's not a homogenous group. Mm -hmm. um, so the legal definition, in a sense, will cover everybody, but the experiences and the um, responses will be different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. I'll, I'll bring you in very briefly, Danny, because I've got another couple of questions I wanted to ask, and I know other committee members want, want to ask questions. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Thanks. I'll be extremely brief. Just to place on record, when I, when I cite the, the broad definition from the ICR Treaty, which is integrated into our domestic legislation, and recognise the rights of all the communities which I've identified within that submission, that's not indulging in, in what about it, and I hope that that wasn't uh, the insinuation with regards to that because what I've heard from the communities which are referenced is the specific lived examples which they face so it's not me just saying a community's name who might happen to identify under the law when in actual fact there's no barriers to them whatsoever the specific reason I mentioned the different communities is because they have barriers which they face because that's what they tell us and that's actually also what the evidence tells us poverty statistics have already referred to hate crime unemployment you know we talk about these are similar experiences which all of these communities under the legal definition face now dealing with something which afflicts sorry i'll be extremely quick dealing with something which Eddie. afflicts one community Sucent. means that it's mutually reinforcing to deal with these things these things are not mutually exclusive and actually if we extend and use the full legal definition and recognize the variations which people face it places race significantly higher on the agenda because it becomes a much much bigger issue and develops the empathy between communities and the momentum we need right. for change okay, okay. sorry i interrupt no, panel no, members to see when i make that face just uh -huh. bring your point yeah. to a close yeah. thank you um Mary, your other questions thank you um and, and i will be quite quite brief um Kalyani, you, you talked about the gypsy um traveler community and you'll know that i have a, a keen interest in, in the gypsy traveler community and it's something that i have tried to champion um, since I've, I've been in here um and, and the, there is that issue about the scottish parliament as a, a human rights guarantor following the legal definition but also recognising that there are specific issues that face specific communities. And I think that w within that, the Gypsy Traveller community and the work that's been done on the Gypsy Traveller community with the, with the Ministerial Working Group is a perfect example of how Parliament and committees can pick one particular grouping of people and do a specific piece of work while still recognising and acknowledging the legal definition. Is that something you would like to see Parliament do more of and committees do more of? I certainly would. I, I do think it sets, um, 
it, it sets a really good example of how things could be taken forward. It's that joint working. But I think also it's about the resources that were put, put into that work. Um, so the, the question of how you align policy and delivery. Um, so you have local authority, you know, the uh, sub-state structures and then the policy. And how do you work together? Putting in the resources into COSLA, having a, a member of staff working specifically on it. Um, doing the, the going out to the communities and actually uh, bringing together all the different players and the actors shows you how you can take um, systems that are geared for one for, for what is considered to be the norm. So your policy planning system, for instance, the housing needs assessment, um, gypsies felt uh, and. Uh, a, lo a lot of BME communities fall out of that. So, so there is the chance of saying, how do you work this so it is flexible, so that it includes everybody? And that, I absolutely agree with you. There are, it shows you how you can do it. My worry slightly is that um, without, often you can't, the read across, it's not, you know, that particular people were there at a particular time and you made something happen. Replicating that is not that easy. And so I take Jackson's point about scrutiny. So you need to make sure that not only do we learn from that, but we, we, do, yeah, yeah, we don't simply rely on the fact that that's what's going to happen because you need, you know, it, it, the two things aren't exactly the same. Yeah. But I, t I totally agree with you. That was, you saw a particular, a perfect storm where things came together in a way that made things happen. One of the things that we, we, we constantly get um, criticism and we talk a lot about is the way we use um, data. So is it an issue we could actually be slightly more clever and a bit more proactive about how we use our data and, and take a, a set of figures relating to, say, housing or employment within a particular grouping of people? and use the example of the work that was done with the Gypsy Traveller community and use the data to proactively help a particular grouping of people or eth ethnicity. I see, John, you're, you're nodding your head. I think data is a critical part of this. And in our last Scotland Fair report, we highlighted again a number of key data gaps. Because without data, you don't have evidence. And without evidence, you don't really know what you're trying to tackle and the solutions to tackle that. So I was pleased to note in the first year activity report about the work around trying to improve data gathering, split out, and that's, that's an issue I think across the public sector. And certainly as part of our new strategic plan, one of the areas we're going to focus on is looking at whether we think the data gaps are and how we can point a light on that and help organisations to improve in their practice of gathering data. Because how do you know you're succeeding if you don't know what the data sets are? And there's a lot of work to be done around that. So I think committees using that as an example uh, is a good thing in terms of leadership and, and yeah. I have one final brief question to ask, if that's all. okay, thank you. No. Yeah. And it's, it's specifically um, to, um, to, to you, John, because it's about um, the report that, that the, the HRC did on tackling um, racial harassment in universities, and, and you have received criticism um, for in, including um, anti-English or racial harassment or racial discrimination. What, what do you have to say about that? Do you think that was a, a, a relevant thing to do? Um, or, or do you think it's been helpful to the statistics? Would you do it again? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, yes, I think we, when we set out the inquiry, when we set out any inquiry under, under our powers, we, we, we're trying to address a particular issue. And then we just go where the data takes us. And I think in, in that particular example, uh, the, 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 the evidence we got back from surveys and, and speaking to students and staff around Britain was that there was some evidence that people were expressing that it had happened to them and in the context of the definition that's covered. I think in our reflections around how we, we've done that, we've reflected on how we've done that inquiry, and I think we may have been, I think in future we'll take that on board in terms of how we address particular points like that that were were raised as a sort of sensitivity in terms of how we'd expressed it uh, in the final inquiry report. Okay, that's helpful. Press you a little bit. I suppose one of the specific criticisms was that when you include um, white communities that it waters down the impact on, on black communities and that um, white migrant communities, their whiteness will always be absorbed. That was one of the criticisms. How would you respond to that? 
I think we, we would say that that was an element of the report, but the major thrust of the report was discrimination faced by black minority ethnic students. Um, there was some evidence that suggested that, that issue as well, but the main thrust of the report and the recommendations are on, on that. Um, and as I said, we, we do reflect on all pieces of work and, and take on board reflections from others and criticisms in terms of how we might do better in the future. Thank you. I'm going to move us on next. We have a number of um, colleagues that need to come in. Um, Fulton McGregor. Yeah, thanks. Good, Good morning, panel. I'll just say for, um, for the, noting for the, the, the clerks that I'm the convener of the Racial Equality Group, and I make that a uh, notification uh, given that I've came across most of you in that capacity, uh, both as the panel today and then uh, behind in the gallery as well. In fact, a couple of uh, previous secretariat um, in front of us today. I'm going to ask questions about the Racial Equality Action Plan, and if you, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll combine the two questions um, in the interest of time, because I know that we've had a very um, thorough session already so far. I'd like um, each organisation, if you're able, to um, speak about what you're doing to support the, the Racial Equality Framework and Race Equality Action Plan, and specifically um, about how you feel it's progressing, the concerns um, and otherwise. Um, and I know that it, for, for those of you who were there just a couple of weeks ago, we had Christina McKelvey uh, speaking about the, the action plan at the, the last um, racial equality group. So I, I could perhaps start with yourself, Jan, if that's all right, yeah. because uh, some of it's came from, from your letter. Yeah, thanks. Um, so just we get funding from Scottish Government Equality Unit uh, to assist them with some of that work. A um, couple of things to say, I suppose. Firstly, to some extent, the framework and the commitments within it seem to have been forgotten about. So people are not really talking about those things at the moment. And we, we're trying to bring that back in. Uh, in terms of actual, what are we doing to support the government and the race equality action plan? So we're, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we, we are actively talking with people in the Scottish Government Equality Unit. Uh, we support the plans to refresh the action plan. Uh, we're hoping to work with departments of the government in helping them with that. Um, the only thing, as I said earlier, is despite all that work that may or may not happen in the next few weeks or months, and we're, we're almost at the end of year two of the action plan now, December, um, there's no guarantee it will lead to actual activity and changing people's lives, and that's what we're really worried about. So, and, and one of the things, as we've noticed uh, anecdotally, is as staff move around departments in the Scottish Government, the focus either goes higher or lower, depending on who the person is and what, what they're aware of. And, and we need to embed these issues into the work of the government, not just have it as members of staff who are keen on it or know what they're doing. Uh, so that's, that's a challenge. I'm not sure what the answer to that one is. But we are actively talking to people in the Equality Unit working and hoping to work with departmental staff to, to work on the refresh at least. Um, Part of that will be actually setting much better monitoring mechanisms so we can see what, what we're achieving or if we're not achieving it, why we're not achieving that. I think that's that's what's missing from the current uh, framework and action plan a little bit. There, there's no act, there's no great monitoring mechanisms. And um, so as we said in our letter, which I hope you've seen, that was only sent this week, we, we still, and we, we recommended this years ago, we still think an external advisory group for the Scottish Government would would really help matters. So we're still keen to push that. Okay. In terms of our, our work uh, in the next period, the thing that we will probably focus on most is the review, the Scottish Government's commitment to review the specific duties of the public sector equality duty. It's We've now got a, f a first four or five year period of how the specific duties that were introduced through this parliament have, have functioned and operated. We see the public sector equality duty as a potentially very powerful tool to help certainly public authorities in their responsibilities around eliminating discrimination and promoting equality and community cohesion. And we, as I think was noted in the first year of the report, have done a couple of pieces of research last year to look and assess, and we've been doing quite a lot of assessment over the four-year period about how the public sector duties have operated. And we hope to use that learning to influence the government um, work with the government in terms of how we can make those tools more powerful and, and, and better in terms of how, how they're operated. So that's certainly one area that we'll be very much concentrated on in the next. And how, of course, it links into other things that the Parliament has enacted around the socioeconomic duty 
and how those two things interact as well. So, and we'll also be um, playing a, a role in terms of how the work on incorporation of human rights into Scots law would, would, would work as, as another tool to help in all of this. So those are some of the things we'll be doing in the next period around this work. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, apologies, Convener, just before I, I respond to Fulton's uh, question, which, which I will do in detail, I would like to place on record our concern, both with regards to the tenor of the question about the whiteness uh, faced by people who face anti-English or had faced in, in, individual examples of anti-English racism, and John's potential uh, nervousness about saying that EHRC may or, you know, will take into consideration how we deal with that in the future. As I've said already, these are customary international norms that cannot be derogated from. It is not necessary to juxtapose the rights of one group against another group based upon their skin colour. Someone who faces anti-English racism in their workplace uh, has the right for that to be recognised as such and for that to be progressed. Is it the same as the structural racism which may face someone of colour? No, it absolutely is not, but these things are not in competition with each other. We can deal with these things uh -huh. at the same time. So I'd just you've, like to place uh -huh. that on record. You've made your point. I suppose I should be clear. These are not criti my personal criticisms or criticisms mm -hmm. of, of the committee. We're just raising issues that have come to the fore and you acknowledged yourself that this is a massive issue and this is a, a, an introductory session for yeah. us. So what I want to do is make sure that everyone on the panel gets a fair opportunity to, to raise their I, perspective. I, I completely so appreciate we'll be... and understand that, and that hence why I've just responded to place our position on the record okay. with regards to what are human rights norms at a human rights committee. Uh, Council, or Fulton, uh, with regards to what we are doing in terms of progressing um, the race equality framework, as I said in the, the informal discussion this morning, I'll repeat again, there, we felt there was an overemphasis uh, both in terms of potentially the REAP, but at, certainly at the conference we held last year with, with Ms McKelvey, uh, that an overemphasis on the third sector, and as I've already said, that Semvo, Clare, uh, other race equality partners from the third sector do not hold the power dynamics in terms of progressing this, but we can take forward examples of good practice. So this committee and others should be asking duty bearers to come in to respond to these specifics. In terms of what we are doing, uh, I'll give two examples in terms of community cohesion and safety, participation and, and representation of avenues we are taking, which we would have already forecast the substantive change that we want to see take place. Uh, with regards to community cohesion and safety, we are part of uh, the Tackling Prejudice Building Connected Communities Group, which is overseen uh, by Ms uh, Aileen Campbell. Uh, there's a commitment from Ms Campbell and her civil servants to obviously pro pro progress this agenda from an equalities and human rights base and via that prism. So we've instigated a conference uh, over the last number of years in conjunction with our partners at Police Scotland and many other statutory services in order to figure out, you know, the criminal justice system is just the remedy of last resort. There has to be a significant other uh, means and mechanisms in place in order to actually deal with hate crime and hate incidents and where they derive from and how that perpetuates within society. But what quite clearly we've seen is that since the amalgamation of Police Scotland, we've had absolutely zero disaggregation of data on racially aggravated hate crimes uh, since 2013-14. That's not acceptable. And in terms of human rights, it means we're not working in compliance with our legal duties at the international level to the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And the committee, the ICERD committee, has picked up on that and has recommended to the Scottish Government that we actually have to create a system of disaggregated data with regards to hate crime in Scotland. Our policy position going forward via the conduit of that group is that as we develop new hate crime legislation, that in tandem with that we should create a new system of disaggregation which actually enables us to look based upon the international legal definition of what crimes are taking place, where, who they're targeted at and who they're facing so that we can actually allocate resources to deal with all of these particular problems. When it comes to culture and cultural recognition, we work with Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop's group uh, they've done fantastic work in terms of taking a human rights based approach to an inclusive national identity, putting forward proactive opportunities for diverse ethnic and cultural minority communities to participate within Scotland's winter festival period, St Andrew's Day, Burns Day, so on and so forth. And it's not about these communities uh, endorsing a monocultural Scotland of shortbread and bagpipes and, uh, and so on and so forth, but celebrating their cultural identity and Scotland's modern dynamic identity using their own cultural characteristics. Does that mean that, we'll, that we've reached the, you know, the panacea in terms of Scotland's inclusive national identity? No, we need the further duty bearers, Creative Scotland, uh, 32 local authorities and so on and so forth to see how they're going to respond to that and ensure that their funds and their engagement with ethnic and cultural minority communities is done progressively and coherently as well. So we have 
shoots of work, we have it progressing, and we have forecast into the future about the dynamics of the duty bearers who have to, you know, take forward their work in order to take, in, in order to respond coherently to it. And this committee and others will have a critical place to ensure that happens. Okay, thanks a lot. Pardon Carolina has. Yeah, I felt, um, okay. Um, so your the race equality action plan. So Semba Scotland is also funded. Um, from the, the race equality unit um, to provide um, enterprise in terms of the action plan. There's uh, enter social enterprise support to minority ethnic groups and individuals, um, social entrepreneurs, including young people, 17 plus. Um, and basically for many individual social entrepreneurs, um, social enterprise is the only route into the labour market. That's what we've, we've discovered and that's what we support. Um, I could give you figures, but I'm pretty sure that we're tight for time, so I'll pass. I'll move on to just give you headings, really. Um, so uh, other um, programmes of work, early learning and childcare is also part of the action plan. It's being funded, and we're actually, since September 2018, we've organised a series of events throughout Scotland to increase awareness of ethnic minority communities of the Scottish Government's campaign to recruit an additional 11,000 into the EL sector. So that's ongoing work. And again, we've got figures um, that we can provide for that, if anybody's interested. Um, health and social care as well, that was a, a year pilot that was carried out. It turned into then another year we were asked to provide. It was in um, various areas, so, uh, South Ayrshire, Dundee, Perth and Kinross, and East Renfrewshire, health and social care. Um, and again, that was a piece of work that was carried out. And again, reports have been produced as a result. In terms of poverty, um, we've had social security experience panels and helped um, Scottish Government organise two events in 2019. Uh, 35 minority ethnic people attended and six people have expressed an interest in participating in, in that further. Um, so in terms of participation and representation, I support the Scottish Minority Ethnic Women's Network. Um, that was um, supported to become a registered charity now, and it's got its own ex executive committee. And it's going to drive forward ethnic minority women's engagement in local and national decision-making processes. So that's something that we are we are doing very much so. Um, in terms of Community Empowerment Act, we've worked with Scottish Government to organise three events to increase ethnic minority awareness of Community Empowerment Act with a focus on asset transfers. Um, quite a number of people attended the workshops, 37 in total, and we're currently supporting Pollock Shields Development Agency with a community asset transfer request to the Glasgow City Council. And this is a good st case study in how minority groups are engaging with the Act. Again, we can provide that information and evidence if need be. In terms of the race equality framework, um, we've improved capacity to tackle racial equality and meet the needs of minority ethnic people. Um, and Scotland's public sector workforce is representative of its of its uh, communities. So we've we, we've enabled that um, through the race equality mainstreaming work, which which I had, and through some of the increasing participation and representation of minority ethnic individuals in governance and influence in decision making at local national level. And we've done that um, through our public appointments work. So that's kind of hopefully um, addressing some of what you were looking for, um, Fulton, in terms of information. We were also the, the, the secretary, secretariat that's on the way out from supporting the cross-party party group on racial equality. Um, so that, that's some of it. I'd be interested to receive those figures, so if you're able to just write in with them, that would be I, yeah, helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, um, I used to be the um, race equality framework advisor and I came off that well, almost a year ago now and uh, for a while um, uh, after a while I agreed to go back and sit on the program board so I think uh, what I would like to see is changes or strengthening the governance of the delivery around the uh, race equality action plan um, I mean as John was saying it's the first three years uh, now's the time to take stock and the focus on refining what's in the action plan to strong impactable actions not losing out on the wider um, issues and actions that are in the framework and in the action plan 
but coming up with a, a, the directors of each service coming up with a few impactable actions that will make a difference that you can see measure and will make a difference to people on the ground i think uh, that's a really important uh, step and getting the articulation between the board and the directors the delivery board and actually getting the governance right I think is a, a really important thing to do and I'm going to do that for a while not very long but but for a while I hope that 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 would be a, a contribution okay. thanks very much okay Oliver uh, thank you uh, convener I, I wanted to ask uh, what your view is on how the Scottish Government has engaged with the with communities uh, at grassroots level around the action plan and I guess uh, specifically just to highlight from this morning a sort of feeling that often there's sort of consultation but it, that it's not meaningful um, and that it sort of takes place at a level below uh, where the decisions are being made um, and a feeling you know, amongst uh, some communities certainly um, that there's limited diversity still uh, you know, within a, you know, a decision making level within lots of important organisations in Scotland, including uh, here in the Parliament? Yes, of course. Um, that's probably a question you should ask of the Scottish Government, I think. But uh, from our point of view, uh, we, we were heavily involved in working on the race equality framework, and hundreds of people were consulted on that. That was a few years ago. The action plan, I'm not aware of any massive consultation that was done before that was published. Mm -hmm. So I think that really came out of other work, not through community consultation. And maybe that explains some of the weaknesses within the plan. Um, the, the other issue is a lot of the actions in the action plan are, well, there's a lot of process issues which communities are not really interested in. They, they want to know what's going to change their lives. So if there was more of that, you know, the actual vision of the plan is X, then we can probably get more buy-in from communities. But to say we will work with delivery partners or we will, you know, it, communities are not interested in that sort of thing. They want to see change and, and they want to see change now. Oh, I mean, people have mentioned this is a three-year plan, but we've had race equality initiatives for the last 30 years. It's not, it's not something new we're doing. We've been working on this, and, and you know, as we started off by saying, the frustration is how little change there is. Uh, and because, uh, again, um, Kalyani said this earlier, we know what the issues are. So whilst community engagement is important and community consultation is important, to go and ask them what are the issues is wasting our time and their time. Uh, we know what the issues are. Let's ask them about implementation mechanisms, if that's what we want to do, or let's, let's see, actually ask them if our outcomes have been achieved. I mean, I, I think there is um, different l layers of consultation, and I think talking directly to people who are um, affected by particular things is really important. I, I, I think there is a role for intermediaries, but I also think there is a, what one needs to hear is from people directly who are you know, in a particular situation, and I, I suppose you want to hear that in your leaders' forum and so on, so you actually hear this is what's happening to me and and this is what you say but this is what's happening to me and so what is the gap between what you say and what will happen to me and i i think for me um having many many years ago worked with um uh, women's groups who uh, people who were particularly isolated and who were referred to the group by um health visitors and so on I think um, hearing their story was very, very different from what you would hear from, from other people. And, and, and so um, I often wonder whose voices aren't being heard. Where are the people who are poor, who are, who are experiencing poverty, who are isolated, who, whose needs and, and the, um, are maybe different? And, uh, and I, so there's a, there is an exercise to be done about whose voice isn't being heard. Thank you very much. Um, I, Oliver, it's an absolutely critical question. Um, the legitimacy of this plan, the success of this plan, the viability of this plan can only be grounded in the individuals and communities that it seeks to respond to. So in terms of the community engagement aspect of it, 
it is absolutely fundamental, if not the most important part of the plan, particularly for a framework which is to stretch from 2016 to 2030 uh, and, the, and the variations and circumstances which may occur during that time. We go back then to, you know, who has the fundamental responsibility with regards to this? I can certainly speak from, from Bemis's behalf and, again, place it on record and clarify for anybody listening or anybody else in the room. Bemis is an organisation, as an intermediary. We don't speak on communities' behalfs. I can't speak on behalf of the Muslim women. I can't speak on behalf of Jewish people. I can't speak on behalf of Sikh San Jog or intercultural youth or anybody else. But what we can do is raise awareness of issues which affect our membership, and our membership is represented under the, the Article 1 International Human Rights Law definition. Now, going back to the point I made earlier about the overemphasis of the progression of the action plan and the framework being solely on or disproportionately within the third sector, none of the organisations uh, within this room can authoritatively say that we represent every ethnic minority organisation and individual in Scotland. So where does the power lie? The uh, Scottish Government has a, a, certainly in the Equality Unit, who work incredibly hard to take this forward, and other directorates, all have responsibilities to engage, but who critically, from a human rights-based perspective, through the panel process, for the people who don't know what a panel process is, which is a human rights-based approach, participation, accountability, non-discrimination, equality and legality, this must be part of all of the engagement processes that duty bearers take forward. John mentioned the EQIA process earlier on. Part of the problem when you have the EQIA process and a local authority who doesn't know what race means is that when they're taking forward a piece of work, they'll only ask one narrow dynamic of the legal definition and not everybody. And when we're saying that if you actually get everybody in the room covered by the legal definition, it makes it a much bigger issue. It develops empathy and it drives momentum for change. So the engagement process, yes, we we'll fundamentally will take that on board and continue our work within that regard. I'm sure government will, and I'm sure my colleagues around this table will. But the duty bearers and the fundamental people who hold the power within the delivery of this plan must also take it on board. And again, we return to this committee and other committees ensuring that that's taken forward. Are you content? Okay. Um, Annie. Thank you, convener. I will, for the brevity of time, I'll put my two questions together. So for each of the policy areas within the Race Equality Action Plan, are there aspects of the plan that you would pick out as stronger or weaker? And also, do you think the, the action plan is achievable in the time frame that it's given? That is a big, big question. It is. <laughs> Partly because, <laughs> partly because it's so it covers such yeah. a. So if you're looking at each one, it's quite big. And I think partly partly part, part of the problem with the with the plan is so little of it is focused on race. So even if there are good things happening, you, you can't get a grasp on on what that is. Uh, I mean, some of it when I looked at, I thought. I'm not sure that this couldn't is just not part of a wider review. Where is the race aspect to this? Um, and so it's difficult to actually grapple with it for that. I mean, that's better in some cases and not in others. But by and large, I did feel myself that um, th that the problem with, with it was that it it needed to be much clearer. They need to show what are the actions that would give the impact. So it's quite difficult to answer your question. I mean, there was stuff on the health, for instance, wh where I felt, you know, there was nothing in this that isn't part of a wider review. And slightly my concern was, if you looked at the issue of, of data collection, somebody brought that up, um, and there seemed to be, perhaps it's my reading of it, and the, that that there was a... Um, kind of less if it, you know, it, it's going to happen sometime in the future and so on. So if you look at the data collection, recently, quite recently, the Mental Welfare Commission um, produced a report which showed that for detention um, uh, uh, in, in terms of mental capacity, what they couldn't tell from the forms that were sent to them was they, at, at presently, only f there were 5% were of BME origin. But 25% of the forms had no, uh, you couldn't tell the ethnic origin of the, um, of the person who had been detained. Now, this is a really serious matter. People are being detained because it's a really serious matter. And so when I looked at it, I just thought, um, I, I, I felt disappointed and, and I felt there was an urgency here 
that that isn't really being looked at in a way that it should. So, um, what I'm hoping is that in the filtering of the the plan, the exercise that directors are going to have to do to look at what are the key things, who do we need, how do we need to measure that, and so on. Next, the next iteration would would be able we would be able to answer your question. Um, yeah, I, th I think, as Kayani said before, uh, the Gypsy Trial Session is the best in terms of structure and, and uh, updates on actions, and, w and we should learn why that is and why that hasn't applied to the other sections. Um, and then just to echo what Kayani said, we, we did a full analysis of each of the actions and the updates, and, and our sum we summarized that 40% of the updates, that apart from the Gypsy Traveler ones, didn't have a race focus. So in a sense, I don't think we can say any one of the other sections is better or worse necessarily. And because we're actively talking or hoping to talk to departments just now, I don't want to name anybody, but absolutely we need to ask that question when the new iteration is out because there will be uh, differences, I'm sure. I suppose just echoing some of the comments as well, there's, I suppose the plan is there to deliver on the framework and there's a very ambitious goal for 2030. So um, I suppose looking at the actions, I think like others, there are an awful lot of activities, but it would be useful, I think, to see how those relate more clearly to the proposed outcomes. And also government has quite a wide role in this, doesn't it, in terms of it's a facilitator, it's a resource enabler for others to do other things. It, it can it can, in a sense, point some of its agencies to do things, and there are things it can do itself. And I would personally quite like to see more of that drawn out in terms of, yes, all of that other stuff it does to help others do things is good and helps to drive change, but there are also what are things it's uniquely that the government can do. And I think that's partly why the Gypsy Traveller plan has been mentioned, because that was something that the government was working on directly to put into to place, and that's, I think the quality of that came through. For us, I, I think we would be clear that one of the things we think government can do that would potentially drive a lot of change for others is around their review of the duties and a focus for them on that, you know, looking at what's happened and how the duties can be improved would, for us, be a real driver for, potentially for change through the whole public sector if that's done properly. So I guess that is a sort of answer. There's a lot of stuff going on. That's good, but more clarity on what they think is going to achieve the longer-term change and those goals. Because it's not a long time, 15 years, given the systemic problems. So things put in place in this first period are going to be really important in terms of what happens to the delivery of change in the, in the latter half of the programme. Danny. Thank you. And I promise I'll be as brief as possible. Um, the, the, the plan is indicative of a, an issue which we've faced within race and race equality in Scotland over a significant number of years. And I've alluded to it with regards to the third sector will fix it, be Miss Sam Voltaire, they'll go and do it. This is also the case in government. The equality unit will deal with that. If it's to do with race, give it to the equality unit. The equality unit will take that forward. So, you know, I think our colleagues in there, Harry and George and Hillary, have done a significant amount of work to try and raise the profile of race within government departments uh, in order to take that forward. And where there's a lack of recognition of the importance of race, which I think Jatan said that they've, they've potentially come up against with regards to engaging with other departments. It falls back to the, the absolute primary issue of the, the potential of this plan is that even within government, a lot of departments don't know what race means. They don't know what we're talking about. How can we possibly actually take forward a problem if we don't actually know and we've not defined what we're talking about? Now, I've already alluded to this. this uh, there is a definition of racial discrimination as part of customary international law, and there's the Equality Act definition. These should be seared into the walls of directorates and government departments uh, across the country and in local authorities and in statutory bodies. It's not a particularly long definition. It's not particularly complicated, and it should form part of everything they're doing when they're taking it forward. The reason the Gypsy Traveller example has been so successful is because it's quite clearly focused on a single community. Mm -hmm. We have to increase awareness and recognition of the diversity of experiences of communities to define under the racial definition, and we need to support the Scottish Government's Equality Unit, the third sector, other directorates, local authorities to actually up their game and a parliamentary committee like this is a huge role to play and say, right, everybody, lift your game and ask them to come in here and talk about it. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
forgive me for a, a, a second, Jatin, where the limitations of a Thursday committee means we have to be finished by a certain time and I've still a colleague to bring in, so I'm going to um, leave um, additional contributions and if I can make a plea to keep responses short and you can of course write to us with any points but the points that have been made previously are we hear them and, and they're on the record um, Angela Constance Thank you very much convener in the spirit of what needs to be done um, I want to have a quick fire round with the panel asking you to share your reflections uh, on the programme board and delivery group how it's doing, its role in the importance of leadership within the Scottish Government across the public sector, measuring impact, and crucially, the funding that's needed to support implementation of the action plan. Uh, and I would like to start with Ms. Khan, please, if you don't mind. I am, um, well, I th it's quite a, a lot there in terms of responding. I think. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd a minute to reflect, we can come back I think, to you. Yeah, because I'm th still thinking on funding. I don't really know how <laughs> much funding is I get perhaps, caught up on perhaps that. Perhaps I could um, refer the question to Miss Lyle, please, yeah. since you've got you know, first-hand experience uh, well, of the programme board. Well, it is a big question and there's a lot in it. I mean, I, I think in terms... I've, I've already referred to governance and what needs to happen. Um, I, I do think that what is... It, picking up on what, what Danny was saying, what is critical, it seems to me, mainstreaming only works if the people in the economy have the authority and to, to, to the other departments. It, it, it doesn't work if it's about a kind of negotiation and you, you can't get them to do what you want. So you get a plan with stuff in it that you don't agree with, but you don't have the, pa you don't have the authority to say, actually, this won't wash, you know. This, this isn't going to deliver anything. So, so I think there's a question of authority. There's a question of resourcing, because I think one of the reasons that the Gypsy Traveller stuff worked was you had leadership and you had resourcing. So, you, so how do you align policy and delivery? Having somebody in COSLA with that as a full-time role to deliver that. So I think there's a question of how you resource that work. I think thirdly, I think something about um, clarity. Um, in terms of being clear about what it is you're going to do and the process about how you're going to get there and how you're going to measure it and a process for doing that and governance that looks over all of that. And I think myself, I am, I said this before, but I am an optimist who worries. And, and so, I mean, I think that what I can see from the way that the programme board has looked at this and have felt... This isn't working. We need to do something different and about refining it, making employment one of the key issues, about looking at, the, at, at, at how the measurement framework would go in. I think it's giving, it's hopefully give us a starting point to make it better. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Haria? Yeah, um, it's hard to answer that question because we don't actually, we're not, we're not members of either of those groups. Um, we did get invited to a program board meeting back in May but the last minute that's been published by the government is from March, so we don't know what's really happened in, in those months uh, from the programme board. So we, we, you know, we, in our submission to you, we did ask some questions like, if they signed off the action plan update with 40% off actions with no race focus, why did they do that? And alternatively, if they didn't sign it off, why didn't they sign it off? You know, that's a fundamental question, I think. Thank you. Um, other contributors, Mr Boyle? Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, the programme board obviously has a, a, an important role to play. Again, I had m mentioned to Mr Johnson at the conference last December that it, it may be beneficial for the programme board at their meetings to engage with uh, different organisations and different grassroots organisations, some of whom represented here today, as a bare minimum, just to actually speak to the people that uh, the programme board is delivering to. That's a basic fundamental tenet of a human rights-based approach. Um, but again, I, I would go back to the, the fundamental point. I think Jatan's alluded to it slightly. We're not sure what the terms of reference are of the programme board. What, what, when they're talking about race, what are they talking about? Um, maybe that's maybe that's reflected within the apparent incoherence of aspects of actions which have been returned from different departments or local authorities, or so on and so forth. 
if there's multiple definitions of a problem we're trying to address, then how can we take it forward? The programming board's important, but it could do with more engagement. Thanks. Just repeating some of the stuff or building on some what others have said around, I think it has a really important role in terms of the focus, because this is such a huge issue. Where can the government most effectively focus its own efforts and energies in terms of what it does it wants to do itself, get its own house in order across all parts of it? And as Kalyani said, the importance of governance to make sure that um, it's a long-term program. So it's really important that that focus is maintained and that there's the opportunity to review and refresh if it's not working out, I think would be the key things that has to take into account. Thank you. And Ms. Khan, sorry to put you on the spot um, earlier. Is there, there anything you would like to add? Just supporting Jat and, and um, Danny there. I think certainly my hesitation with all the, the boards that you mentioned, the programme board in particular, is that I'm not familiar with, with that work. Therefore, I got kind of stuck on the funding part of it. But I think that, yeah, in possibly, if anything, going back to um, the framework, the action plan, and what I've said before in terms of some actions being easier to measure, um, the, certainly the alignment aspect of both the framework and the action plan, which some are missing from there, uh, and that's the reporting aspect of it. But I think certainly it's, um, not really knowing some of the, the boards that, you're, you, that you had mentioned before, Miss Constance, I wasn't able to answer that, and apologies for that. Not at all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that um, brings our session to an end. Can I thank you all very much for your, for your evidence. Our next meeting is the 28th of November, and the committee will continue to hear evidence on race equality in Scotland. I now move us into private session. <laughs>